Good morning to all of those who are joining us this morning for the live stream from the Smith Cove Baptist Church. This Sunday, August the 21st, we are meeting at the Lord's table at the end of the message this morning for the communion service. And uh, personally, I would say that it doesn't matter what denomination that you come from. As so long as you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the risen, living Son of God who died for your sins, that is the invitation from Jesus Christ for you to join with us as we observe the Lord's table. This morning, a couple short readings, one from Genesis chapter 12, and, and actually I'm reading in the New Testament our scriptures that I would normally share for the just prior to the communion service. So first, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Then from the New Testament. From Matthew's gospel, as Jesus was gathering with his disciples, what we refer to as the Last Supper, the Passover meal. Matthew 26, starting at verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it. All of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Heavenly Father, we ask your continued blessing upon your word to write your message and your word upon our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. It doesn't take much to confuse me, but it does baffle my mind that Christians in all sorts of circles and all sorts of denominations all over the world, many have little regard for the Jewish people. As history shows us, of course, countless Jews have been mistreated, killed, tried to be exterminated, and sometimes this is by professed Christians at different times throughout our history. There's a term we hear, anti-Semitism, which is a word that describes, at the very least, ill will or even downright hatred of the Jewish people. Many people of the Christian faith, they go along with a certain amount of ill will towards the Jewish people, thinking, well, it was the Jewish people who crucified Jesus Christ. Well, the Romans did it to avoid having an uprising over the fate of Jesus. Jews are, of course, the brunt of a lot of jokes, showing them to be shrewd and tough business people. But as per the Jewish people being responsible for Jesus' death, well, in a way, you can say that that is true. It was the religious leadership that was calling for his crucifixion. But when you look at the whole of time, each and every one of us are responsible it's because of our sins that Jesus was going to end up being the Lamb of God. We're all responsible for Jesus' death. Remember, Jesus is God in the flesh. God purposed to sacrifice himself through Christ to redeem us, to save us from the penalty of sin. So Jesus, God's one and only son, God in the flesh, was going to be that sacrificial lamb one way or another. It had been God's will to lay upon the Lord himself the sins of the world. So some of you listening this morning, what I share might not be news to you, but it's highly likely that maybe some, it might be an eye opener, how we as Christians should be in relationship and how we should be treating the Jewish people. Some of you may not even know someone that's Jewish. Maybe because they don't want you to know that they're Jewish in fear of mistreatment. Some Bible teachers teach that the church has replaced the Jewish people and that all the promises of God, all those promises that he gave Abraham and the Jewish people, well, they lost them. 
when they rejected Christ. And now that we as Christians and, and have we have accepted Jesus, we're somehow the new Jews, if you like. I'm certainly paraphrasing, but there's no truth to that. It's called replacement theology. If God could break his word to Abraham in, that, in the scriptures that I shared with you earlier, that forever God would bless Abraham. If God could break his word to Abraham, then we are in serious, serious trouble. God does not break his word. Early in Genesis, we have God choosing Abraham out of all the peoples of the earth. And those few verses that I shared earlier, we find that promise from God to Abraham. He calls him out of his land, out of the land of his fathers. He says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And I'm going to make your name great. And I'll bless those who bless you. And I'm going to curse those who curse you. And all of the people on earth are going to be blessed through you. Can you imagine God saying that to you? That would seem like a lot of weight on the shoulders. Wow. And through Abraham's offspring, we have the Jewish nation. You're going to have to read your Old Testament if you're not familiar with this. You're going to have to read your Old Testament. It is true that God had been angry with his people at times. As we read in the Old Testament, God stays true to his word. If his people sought to serve him and worship him, they were blessed and they received God's help. If they fell away from God and rejected God as individuals, as a nation, there would be punishment. God's word, he holds true to it. But never has God said that he would abandon his Jewish people forever. He tells Abraham in 12, chapter 12, verse 3, I'll bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And all of the people will be blessed through you, all people of the earth. So Christians or the church has not replaced the relationship of God that he has with his Jewish people. Mind you, God has allowed them to be mistreated and scattered all over the world since the rejection of Jesus. What has happened is that as the Jews rejected Jesus, we as non-Jewish people, referred to as Gentiles, we have been grafted in to that relationship with God. It is because of the Jewish rejection of Christ that we are accepted by Christ. You have the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, God's chosen people to thank that you are a Christian and that you've been saved by grace. God has told us in scripture that in the latter days, he would bring his people back to their country of Israel. Now, the little nation of Israel is just a fraction in size now compared to what it was when God had given the promised land to the 12 tribes. And since 70 AD, they've been scattered and hunted down for some 2,000 years. They've had no home, but the Lord promised to regather them. And this is one of the monumental prophecies coming to pass in our lifetime. The nation of Israel hadn't existed for close to 2,000 years, but yet the nation, born in a day, it became a nation in May of 1948, and the Jewish people are returning to Israel. This brings to mind what you hear in the news so often. The world is, is shown that the Jewish people are, are bad to the Palestinians. And this conflict is, of course, the Middle East in a lot of turmoil. We shrug it off. Oh, they've been fighting forever. They'll figure it out. Every U.S. president has tried to break, uh, broker a peace deal between the Jews and the Arabs. Israel has no place to call their own except for the land that God had given them. First to Abraham, it's a promise to be theirs forever. In the modern day media seems to side with anybody but the Jewish people. And it creates more hatred and ill will towards the Jewish people, not only for Israel, for those Jews living in Israel, but Jews living anywhere else in the world. We hear of their synagogues being bombed and attacked, even here in Canada and the United States. As believers in Jesus Christ, we need to be praying for, and if not, at the very least, helping the Jewish people for their fight for survival. 
one more thing before I move on. This is not going to be very politically correct so far, probably for some. And what I say next will really not be politically correct for some. I wonder if the live stream will stop. Much of the Arab world is trying to rewrite biblical, biblical history. And they say, oh, they'll agree with some stuff. They'll say, yes, Abraham was given the, the land way back in Genesis. But the rightful heir to the land, so the Arab nations say, it's not Israel, but it's the descendants of Ishmael. This was the first born son to Abraham that he had with his maid, Sarah's handmaiden, not his wife. Biblical scholars will refer to Ishmael as the illegitimate son. But later, the promised son, Isaac, was born. Remember, Abraham and Sarah were like old. Well, I shouldn't say that. Some of us are getting close there. They were well past childbearing age. God promised them a son. Isaac was born. From his wife, Sarah. So the promised son that God would give to Abraham and Sarah. And the Arab world is trying to rewrite history to say that the promised land belongs to them. The sons of Ishmael, not the Jewish people. So after saying all of this, some don't even realize it. But the Jews and the Arabs, because they have the same father, Abraham. They're half brothers, as I've just explained. So moving forward in the message. The second reading I share, as I mentioned at the beginning of the message, is verses in, from Matthew's gospel that I use for communion. We're meeting at the Lord's table today, but first think of this for a moment. Jesus has broken the bread, shared the cup with his disciples. As we know, one would soon betray him, give him up to the Jewish hierarchy, to be arrested. All the others would desert Jesus soon in the coming hours. Jesus knew all of this was going to happen, yet he still promised them, the 12, that he would share this meal, drink from that cup once again in the new kingdom of God when it comes into its fullness, an event, a time frame in our futures. Matthew 26, 29, Jesus, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. God has not forsaken the Jews. Christians have not replaced the Jews as far as their favor from God is concerned. Because of the Jewish rejection of Christ, we as Gentiles have been grafted into God's goodness, his forgiveness, those future promises. The Apostle Paul will teach you in the New Testament, if you will read, these promises are all still valid for the Jewish people. Salvation comes to us through the Jews, through Jesus Christ. They were meant to be a light unto the Gentiles. It is their rejection that brings us grafted into God's relationship. The Apostle Paul will even go on to say that They've been made jealous because we've been grafted in as Gentiles so that they'll want what we have. Some have turned to Christ. The Jewish people have been kind of blinded, so to speak, until the fullness of time, until the age of grace in which we're living in right now, until that comes to an end. The future return of Jesus will usher in a time of tribulation that the world has never seen, and it'll be during that tribulation period that the Jewish people will finally accept Jesus as their Messiah. But until then, the Jewish people are destined to suffer persecution. But let's make sure that us, as Gentile believing Christians, have no part in the ill treatment of Jewish people. Rather, we need to be in prayer for them as individuals, and as them as a nation. Remember, God told Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you. I will curse you or curse those who curse you. Where do we want to be in that promise from God? Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have shown your power. You have shown your wisdom of all things, of the future. Thousands of years ago, you had given the prophets the message that the Jewish people would be scattered because of their disobedience. You've also said, Lord, that you would gather Jacob's children, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the descendants, back into the land that you have promised them. And Lord, we see in our lifetime that the nation has been born again. Lord, we pray for their protection. We pray for their safety, but we know your people have many enemies. We pray, Lord, that you'll remind us not to be those enemies, whether in word or in deed. We pray, Lord, that you'll give us thoughts and prayers to reach out. If we know Jewish people, Lord, encourage us to share the gospel message with them. Heavenly Father, we gather around your table this morning. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you have provided us. You have created us in life. You have given us salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. And you also promise us a future where we've been grafted in to the Jewish nation. Salvation comes to your people first and then to us, the Gentiles. We thank you, Lord, for the table. We pray, Lord, a blessing upon each one here this morning. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Could I have the servers come forward this morning? So if you're sitting at home or wherever you are, if you have a little something to drink or a little something to eat that you can share in this portion of the service with us. Let me share again those scriptures from Matthew's gospel, chapter 26. While they were eating, it's the Passover meal. Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, giving it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus said, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day I drink anew, drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. Jesus had taken bread, ordinary bread of his day, and in his wisdom, knowing that we need bread to sustain our physical lives. That he used bread saying, this resembles my body. His body was going to die. It was going to be brutally tortured. For us, for each and every one of us. And Jesus wanted us to partake in this, what we now call communion. For the Jewish people, it's called Passover. And this bread, this broken body of Christ, we're reminded this morning. It was broken for us. It was broken for the Jewish people. Remember the promise to Abraham, all people of the earth will be blessed through you. Jesus breaking bread, knowing we need bread to sustain our lives. So when we eat this meal, it's symbolic in nature here, but when we eat any meal, we can think of, how we consume Christ in our daily lives. Bread for physical life, consume his word, consume his ways, his guidance for us. We consume that for spiritual life. Dorothy, would you give thanks for the bread and the body of Christ? Father, we thank you. We Thank you, Father, that you sacrificed your only son to give us 
new life to your world forever. Jesus also took the cup. There's a saying that we have that, you know, everyone has their cup to bear. I don't know where and when that originated, but Jesus shared his cup with his disciples saying, drink from it, all of you. As believers in Jesus Christ, we share in Christ's sufferings. Are we called to be crucified on a wooden cross? Highly unlikely. The Apostle Paul will tell us that we are crucified. Our hearts are crucified. Our spirits are crucified. That we die to sin and live for Christ. The cup resembling his blood. This is no, this is not blood. It was common drink. For them as the disciples, the Jewish people in that era, it was wine. Fermented a little bit so that it wouldn't spoil. But asking or commanding his disciples, all of you drink from this. We're sharing the cup of Christ. We're sharing his burdens. And his burdens are not only for us as Gentiles, but for the Jewish people as well. David, would you give thanks for the blood of Jesus in the cup? Amen. Would the servers please serve?
the bread, mm -hmm. the body of Christ. Eat of it and give thanks. We thank you, Lord, for the cup, for the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away all of our sins. Drink it of it and give thanks. Heavenly Father, we, we recall in your Gospels where during that Passover meal that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. We also can recall reading where Peter says, No, Lord, you can't wash my feet. I won't have any part of that. Jesus reminded Peter that he needed to be washed. We are all cleansed, Lord, because of your blood. We are washed clean. But we need daily cleansing. And this is where we come to ask for forgiveness of our sins. Each and every day, because we all fail. We thank you, Lord, for your blood and for your body. For your giving yourself, laying your life down. But we praise you all the more that you had the power to take up your life again. The first of the resurrected to receive immortality, a promise that you give us, Lord, when you return. We thank you. We praise you. Lord, look out for us as we travel and go our separate ways. A blessing on each and every one here and those listening in. Protect our families near and far. And guide us, Lord, in ways that are truly pleasing to you. Be with those in health care, emergency services who, who work to protect and heal us. Give them physical strength, spiritual strength. Be with those who mourn loss of loved ones, Lord, to help them cope. Remind them of the reunion in the future. For us as believers, we will be reunited with you. We praise you and thank you, Lord, and we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessings on your week to each and every one of you. And don't forget, you got to keep washing your hands. Amen.